This man, Richard Orlando, just crossed over to a different world and unlocked the mightiest Lord system. With this system, he can continuously upgrade and evolve his recruited subordinates, as well as purchase various artifacts and equipment for them in the system store. Years ago, he crossed over to this world in the body of a noble bastard's son and obtained the Lord system. He had planned to obtain a knight position, but his father unexpectedly wanted to pass on his title and glory to Richard. Fortunately, he obtained the certificate of pioneering lordship in time and escaped to a place called Solon City. Otherwise, he would have been torn apart by other members of his family sooner or later. This will be a new starting point in his life. One day, the lord of the city approached Richard and gave him some unfortunate news. Richard's father, Calvin, passed away last week. As part of the same family, Richard's half-brother, Wenger, has now listed him as a thorn in his side. As according to family rules, Richard will become the only threat to Wenger's inheritance of the family. However, this does not matter to Richard at all. The reason why the Lord of the City approached Richard and told him this was to ask him to give up the Orlando surname and help Wenger clear any obstacles. As long as Richard agrees, Wenger is willing to provide 500 gold coins to support Richard's own pioneering territory. Then, the men behind him came up with a box, and upon opening it, Richard revealed a satisfied expression upon seeing the full box of gold coins. He thought that this money would be just enough as the starting capital for his new life. However, Richard was not satisfied with just this money. He pretended to be calm and told the Lord that the Orlando surname carries countless glories and honors, which is the most precious thing his father left him. If he were to give it up, then it would cost more money. Upon hearing this, the Lord was momentarily stunned, but immediately understood. Any problem that can be solved with money is not a problem. He told Richard that he could give him a no-interest loan of 1,000 gold coins, but Richard must buy things from him. 500 gold coins plus a 1,000 gold coin loan. These are definitely considerable assets in this world. Upon hearing this, Richard immediately agreed. He inquired if the Lord had a group of barbarian Highlander slaves in the Colosseum. Upon hearing this, the Lord immediately understood his intention. He wanted to use slaves to form a guard team. However, he kindly reminded Richard that those barbarians are not easy to tame. Even if he bought them with the 1,000 gold coins, they might not listen to him. However, since Richard had made this request, he must have done his research beforehand. The Lord then arranged for his men to take Richard to the arena. This is how Richard successfully took the first step in his life plan. So with the guidance of the city lord's subordinate, Richard arrived at the Colosseum. He told the owner that he wanted to buy all the barbarians. The owner was excited at the prospect of a big sale and took them inside the Colosseum. While walking through the corridor, the owner kindly reminded Richard that the barbarians were very fierce and often injured other fighters, causing her to spend a lot of money on medical expenses. She advised Richard to be careful not to let them beat him up and run away. But Richard was even more interested in the barbarians when he saw the monsters on both sides of the corridor. When the owner reminded him again that the barbarians could slaughter and eat crocodiles, Richard was even more excited. He thought it was amazing that they were not only good at fighting, but also self-sufficient. His desire to subdue the barbarians grew stronger. The owner became worried that Richard might have a problem with his brain, but she didn't know that Richard was the man with the strongest lord system on the continent. Looking at the system's attributes, Richard thought that today he could finally show the fruits of his labor in the past three years. When they arrived at the high platform of the Beast Arena, Richard shouted loudly to the barbarians below that he had already bought all of them from the city lord, but he was very aware that they would not easily submit to him. So he decided to have a wrestling match with them. The winner would be granted freedom, while the loser would become his subordinate. After hearing Richard's words, one of the burly barbarians stepped forward and challenged him. The man walked slowly toward Richard, revealing his bulging muscles. After exchanging introductions, they prepared to start. At this point, the owner on the platform was already sweating profusely. She had never seen a nobleman compete against a slave before, and it was even more terrifying that Richard's opponent, Russell, was one of the strongest barbarians who had already killed many slaves barehanded. If something went wrong with the nobleman on her territory, she would also suffer the consequences. She quickly asked her attendants to persuade Richard to reconsider, but he insisted that he only obeyed the city lord's orders and he had no right to interfere. The fight had already begun, with Russell quickly charging toward Richard and headbutting him. And then he grabbed Richard by the shirt. As Richard lay on the ground, Russell patted his hands together and said with disdain that he thought Richard was much more capable, but he had been defeated with just one move. 
the barbarians below continued to jeer and mock Richard, while the owner on the platform was already in despair, thinking that her coliseum was going to close down for good. But at that moment, Richard suddenly grabbed Russell's foot. He slowly stood up, with a smug expression on his face. I was afraid you would say I was bullying you, so I let you make the first move. Then Richard punched Russell hard in the stomach. In Russell's incredulous gaze, Richard radiated a large amount of golden light. This is the skill that Richard has developed over the years of using the Lord system to train his physical body. Power Enhancement Russell, furious, charged at Richard again, but this time the outcome was completely different. Richard easily threw Russell over his shoulder and slammed him to the ground. I win. Russell looked at him in shock. As a barbarian, he had lost to a thin aristocrat and couldn't even follow his movements. But Russell refused to admit defeat and stood up again to challenge Richard. However, Richard, now serious, was not someone he could provoke. Yet, he still refused to accept his defeat. The onlookers couldn't bear to watch any longer and urged him to give up. Even Russell himself was amazed at the result. Just then, a voice interrupted the commotion. A female barbarian walked out of the crowd. She was Gunther, the leader of these barbarians. Upon seeing her, Richard was also excited. If he could defeat her, all the barbarians would be subject to his rule. Gunther quickly attacked with lightning speed, surprising Richard. And then, the system suddenly issued a prompt. The barbarian Gunther has been detected as a hero. Just as Richard was lost in the sudden appearance of the system window, the steel fist of Gunther came flying towards him. Despite just standing up, Richard was already full of curiosity about the hero unit Gunther, as he had never seen one before. However, Gunther didn't give him a chance to catch his breath. She leaped forward and attacked with an uninterrupted series of strikes. The nearby minions cheered endlessly, and even the followers who accompanied Richard felt uneasy. But Gunther's flurry of punches was just a warm-up exercise. She casually picked up a huge rock and threw it towards Richard. With a loud bang, Richard was buried under the rock. Gunther stood proudly on top of the rock, while her minions behind her cheered loudly. Even Russell, who was beaten black and blue, showed a look of admiration. However, at that moment, a voice came from under the rock. Fast speed and strength isn't bad. This is good material. Everyone was shocked by this scene. Even Gunther, as the leader of these barbarians, was surprised by Richard's strength. However, his strength only fueled her fighting spirit. She teleported to Richard's side and bound his neck with an iron chain. You lose! Richard, lying on the ground, did not struggle. He was satisfied with Gunther's performance. He lightly pulled on the chain and broke it apart. Not only did the group of barbarians behind him, but even Gunther herself showed an unbelievable expression. This chain was made by top-level craftsmen specifically for locking up giant beasts. Even Gunther had been trapped by it for many years, but Richard easily broke it with his bare hands. Richard didn't care about the shock looks from everyone else. Fast, powerful, and possesses an established strategy. Really suitable to become my subordinate. However, in Gunther's eyes, Richard's actions felt like an insult. After fighting for so long, he didn't even use his full strength. Gunther angrily shouted at Richard, Since we're both on the same battlefield, please respect me and do your best. Otherwise, I won't submit to you. Upon hearing this, Richard lifted his right fist and began to gather strength. It's Richard's time to show off. Using the same move and routine, the effect on Gunther was completely different. The barbarians watching from a distance also saw the difference between the two. Just then, a large hand like a pair of pliers directly locked onto Gunther's throat. Gunther tried to struggle, but found the opponent's strength to be immense. No matter how hard she struggled, she couldn't break free. Seeing Richard raise his left hand to chop him, Gunther silently closed his eyes, as if he was prepared to die. With a crisp sound, Richard's hand chop did not hit Gunther, but shattered the iron ring on Gunther's body. This move made Gunther's heart race and his breathing became rapid. After knocking down the female leader, Richard turned to the group of barbarians behind him and said, Now you have two choices. First, continue challenging me until everyone loses. Or second, follow me. Richard looked at Gunther as if waiting for her decision. At this point, 
Gunther had been completely conquered. She grabbed Richard's hand and stood up. She announced to the barbarians behind her, from now on, Richard is our new leader. Looking at the muscular and sturdy man, Richard also made a statement. Follow me and work hard. I will make you stronger. In this way, amidst cheers, Richard received a prompt from the system. Looking at the constantly popping up requests to join the team, Richard officially took the first step in his journey. Although he was very much looking forward to his future exploration, it was not good to walk around the streets with a group of half-naked barbarians. So Richard took a group of people to the equipment store in the city. Looking at the dazzling array of equipment, the barbarians were excited like children. But Richard didn't even glance at them, and went straight to the owner and said, I'm here to buy some equipment for my brothers. I hear you have good weapons here. Upon hearing this, the owner guessed that the other party was an expert, and pressed the button on the wall. The walls of the building began to rotate, and a wall of weapons appeared in front of everyone. Richard asked the owner to equip each person with one lance and three throwing spears. The owner quickly calculated and told Richard that it would cost a total of 750 gold coins. However, Richard only brought out 500 gold coins. The owner looked at him with contempt and was about to press the button to close the door and send him away. But Richard already knew that the other party was superficial, and he directly pulled out a legendary equipment, the Dragon Slayer Sword, and handed it over. The owner was so excited that he trembled all over. To have such a good weapon, the man in front of him must be a big shot. He immediately agreed to let Richard pay by credit, and arranged for his employees to quickly get the equipment for everyone. The people who received the equipment were ecstatic. At this time, Gunther came to Richard and asked him what the next step was. Richard smirked and said, We'll be taking over a land that should be ours. Richard and his group are on their way to find a territory. They have been targeted by a goblin and Knoll army lying in ambush on a hill. The excited Knoll captain laughs and says, The opportunity to strike it rich is here. However, Richard had already sensed something was amiss. He turns around and tells the others, Everyone stop, form a circle with the carriages, and keep the livestock and goods inside to prepare for an attack. Then he takes out a bag of pills and tells them it's an eastern pill that can make them stronger. Most people immediately swallow it, but some are still skeptical. Of course, it's fake, it's just regular dough. The purpose is to cover up the Lord system. After all, this system is too powerful. You can level up just by constantly fighting. If the barbarians find out, it could cause a riot. Richard opens the system panel and finds that the vast majority of the barbarians are third level spearmen. Only Gunther is an independent hero unit. After closing the system panel, Richard says, I will let all of you feel the power of this medicine pill. The imminent battle is about to begin. The army of monsters on the hill has already charged down. Richard's side has also prepared for the fight. He was seen holding a spear and shooting it out. But it was blocked by the goblin leader's armor. He exclaimed that the power was great, but not to be feared. Then he shouted to his men, we have several times their military strength. Let's attack together. Due to the difference in numbers, Richard's side is clearly at a disadvantage at the moment. <sighs> However, Richard is not in the slightest panic. He orders Gunther to give him another spear. Then he attaches his head hair with flames and shoots it at the troll on the opposite side. So, one troll was directly shot and killed on the spot, scaring the monster minions to run back. At the same time, it also boosted the morale of Richard's side. Coupled with the system's blessing, they fought more and more bravely. Suddenly, the chieftain of the Jackal Wolf emerged from behind a barbarian, ready to make a fatal blow. But a spear had already pierced through his body, done by Richard. Immediately after, Richard drew his dragon slaying sword and said, The leaders of these bandits are dead. They have lost their fighting power. Take advantage of this and launch a full-scale attack. Under the dual encouragement of the system and Richard, the situation has completely reversed for the barbarian tribe. Gunther said, it turns out that the boss was targeting their leader. Standing on the carriage was also for the convenience of observing. Richard replied, as the saying goes, to catch the bandits, first catch the ring leader. That leaves only one guy now, the goblin leader who planned this attack. You lay in ambush here. Aren't you afraid of other powerful races taking advantage of you? The goblin leader laughed. The nearest would be at the High Mountain Fortress, which is several miles to the east. That place is easy to defend and hard to attack. Besides, those kobolds don't have the guts to come out and snatch my spoils. Richard was surprised that there was an unexpected advantage. 
He was worried about not finding a territory. He said, I felt sorry you couldn't get the goods. So Dragonslaying Sword will now join the battle as a gift for you. In just a blink of an eye, the goblin leader was already decapitated. The other minions were also shocked. At this time, Gunther immediately ordered the capture of the remaining bandits. Richard looked at the notification from the system. Most of the barbarians had been upgraded. The nearby barbarians all felt that their strength had increased, thinking that it was the effect of a mysterious oriental pill. At this time, his men brought two trolls. Richard thought, the horses are gone, so let the two of them pull the goods. He said, from now on, they are the marshals hung in ha. Richard looked at the map and said, so, the next stop is the high mountain fortress. After two consecutive days of traveling, Richard and his group finally arrived at the high mountain fortress. Looking at the clear water in the pool, a group of big guys jumped right in and started washing themselves. This made Gunther a bit embarrassed, but Richard had a harmless smile on his face and secretly told her that there was a secluded pond over there, guaranteed that no one would peek. After taking a break during the day, Richard made his way to the mountaintop under the cover of night. Looking at the two guarding kobolds, Richard and Russell showed a contemptuous expression. Immediately, Richard gave the order to attack. Meanwhile, inside the castle, the kobold leader was wooing a catfolk. At this crucial moment, Richard kicked open the door. The kobolds were so scared that they involuntarily stuck out their tongues and called for the guards loudly. At this point, one of Richard's subordinates came to report that all the kobolds outside had been taken care of. The consecutive events caused the kobolds to collapse instantly. He looked at Richard in rage and said, How dare you attack my troops? I have a dozen tribes of brothers nearby, and they won't let this go if anything happens to me. However, Richard didn't indulge him and immediately hung him up. This frightened the kobold, and he immediately apologized on the spot. Seeing that he were obedient, Richard untied the rope and let him go. The kobold who fled had a resentful look and said, Wait for me. I will seek revenge. After letting the kobolds go, Richard told everyone that not only was the place spacious, but it also had a wide field of view and ample water sources. It was easy to defend and hard to attack, making it a perfect stronghold. However, Richard also warned everyone that there must be a reason why such a good place was occupied by a group of kobolds with few advantages. There were probably many more of their brother troops nearby, so everyone needed to quickly build defensive fortifications. Russell was puzzled and asked, if that's the case, why did we let their leader go? Richard said that he had spent a lot of money on equipping everyone with weapons and equipment before. This time they would collect troops to earn some money. Instead of going out one by one to find them, it would be better to wait for them to come to them and take them all out at once. The peaceful life only lasted for two days. Richard's men discovered a large army station not far away. Richard wiped away the food residue from his mouth and revealed a wicked smile. Since someone has brought money to our doorstep, let's take action tonight. Upon arriving at the enemy camp, Richard noticed that the goblins were incredibly careless, even dozing off while on guard duty, which made it easy for him to launch a surprise attack. If that's the case, I'll take this opportunity to establish my dominance over High Mountain Fortress. Richard arranged for most of his subordinates to go home and defend, while he took a small team consisting of Gunther to proceed. Under the cover of night, the squad quickly sneaked into the enemy's tent and easily ended the lives of the goblins. Watching the neatly organized barbarian troops, Richard quietly opened his system. It seemed that the system had brought them more than just increased strength. Before, they were just a group of simple-minded barbarians who didn't understand the concept of coordination. Now, they had become an elite force capable of forming their own battle formations. However, at that moment, a barbarian suddenly noticed something unusual. As a violent tremor shook the ground, the barbarian was immediately thrown away. Out popped a giant goblin with two horns. This is a goblin with dragon blood, Draco Goblin. And then Draco Goblin began chanting spells. Goblins emerged one by one like groundhogs. This frightened everyone present, including Richard who felt the situation was becoming tricky. But that's not all. The goblins let out another loud roar, and a giant beast with the appearance of a pangolin picked up Draco Goblin on its back. The goblins riding their mounts brandished their axes and were about to get ready to attack. But Gunther was already prepared. She shot a spear directly at the beast. However, the spear bounced off as soon as it touched the creature. In Gunther's shot gaze, the creature had already charged towards her at an incredible speed. The speed was so fast that Gunther cursed under his breath. Right in the midst of the crisis, 
Richard flashes in front of Gunther and tightly embraces the beast's thigh with both hands. The beast looked down on Richard with disdain, intending to throw him away. But Richard shouted loudly. The beast lost consciousness on the spot, and the nearby goblin minions were all stunned to see this scene. Even Draco Goblin, who was thrown off his mount, had an incredulous expression on his face. A noble dragon blood? Ain't you just a noble who surrendered? However, as someone with the bloodline of a giant dragon, Draco Goblin couldn't allow himself to be defeated so easily. He picked up his weapon and swung it at Richard as if it were his last bit of stubbornness. After a loud bang, Richard blocked the axe with one hand and punched with the other. And just like that, a goblin with the bloodline of a giant dragon made a hasty exit after barely making an appearance. As I said, let's make this a quick battle. This battle not only allowed Richard's subordinates to gain a lot of experience and attributes, but also captured the Draco Goblin's mount alive. Richard patted the giant beast's forehead and said, From today on, you are my mount. I will call you Wind Chaser. If you don't behave, I'll cook you and feed you to everyone. It's a pity that these guys are too poor and didn't bring much gold to Richard. Regardless of where you are, gold coins are always a hard currency. They can buy subordinates and all sorts of equipment in the system store. It's a shame that Richard is too poor and can only buy some old and worn out equipment to make do with. Just when Richard was still worrying about gold coins, his subordinates suddenly heard the sound of a fight. Richard picked up his binoculars and saw a caravan being raided by jackals. Judging by the size of the caravan, he knew it wasn't an ordinary one. Richard's face lit up with excitement. He knew that trade was an important aspect of expanding his territory on this continent. If he rescued them, he might even be able to do business with them. Without hesitation, Richard brandished his long spear and pierced through one of the wolfman's bodies with lightning speed. The onlookers were shocked and stood there in amazement. However, this was only the beginning. Gunther raised her long sword and gave the order to attack. The barbarians behind him fiercely charged into the pack of jackals. Richard leaned casually against a tree, not intending to take action this time. His barbarian subordinates had come a long way since they first joined him, not only in terms of strength, but also in terms of military discipline. The wolfmen attacking the caravan were nothing more than a group of disorganized rabble. As expected, it didn't take long for the jackals to start fleeing in all directions. However, Richard had no intention of letting them escape this time. He ordered Windchaser to pursue the remaining wolfmen who had slipped through the net. Watching his victorious barbarian subordinates, Richard smiled with satisfaction. At that moment, the priest of the caravan approached Richard and expressed his gratitude. He promised to sing praises of Richard's virtues upon their return. If you really want to repay me, just give me some money. Suddenly, a voice of a girl could be heard not far away. As expected of a greedy nobleman, you really are an interesting person. Richard turned his head to see a blonde elf walking out of a carriage. She introduced herself as Annie from Voya Trading. She was very grateful for Richard's help earlier and then looked at him with a pleading expression, asking if he could accommodate them for a while. The recent battle had left them severely damaged, so they were hoping to rest and recuperate at the High Mountain Fortress for a while. They also offered money and weapons as compensation for their stay. And at that moment, Annie commanded her subordinates to produce a crystal ball, which she then threw into the air. The crystal ball began to expand. It turned out to be a communication crystal ball used by their caravan. As Richard looked at the crystal ball, he had a meaningful expression on his face. A caravan that possessed such high-level items was undoubtedly not a simple one. He thought that he might be able to earn a fortune with their help in the future. Richard then extended a hand of friendship towards Annie and said, Well then, come with me. I am Richard, the Lord of High Mountain Fortress, and I never turn away friendly guests. Upon returning to his territory, Richard silently observed Annie and soon noticed that she was using a legendary healing potion. This was no ordinary item, and it certainly wasn't cheap. Richard's interest in the caravan grew even stronger. Night fell, and neither party felt like sleeping. As Annie remembered the loss of her subordinates during the day, a sorrowful expression crossed her face. Likewise, Richard was also troubled, but for a different reason. He was troubled by his own subordinates, a group of penniless people who were arguing over a system reward axe. Just as Richard was about to close his eyes and get some sleep, Gunther rushed over in a panic manner. It turned out that she had discovered a large group of centaur troops outside the city walls. As Richard arrived at the city gate and took a look, he immediately noticed a half-human, half-horse girl among the centaur troops. 
Richard instructed his men to throw javelins in an attempt to deter the enemy. However, they paid no attention and continued to march towards the city gate. To their surprise, the enemy disregarded Charlie's warning. Richard ordered his men to throw javelins once again. At that moment, the half-human half-horse girl instructed her followers to stop. She then pulled out a white cloth and hung it directly on a stick. At the same time, Richard's side also noticed that the enemy raised a white flag, indicating surrender. He immediately walked out with his men. Richard looked at the enemy warily and asked for their intentions. The girl, who was part human and part horse, bowed to Richard and introduced herself as Hutt, the clan chief of Clan Patriarch. Then Hutt took out a stone tablet and handed it to Richard. Hutt explained to him that it was an invitation from the Kobolds, a type of mythical creature, to join forces and unite the armies of the Human Horse Tribe under their leadership. However, the Human Horse Tribe had no desire to become bandits. They had always lived a peaceful and stable life, so they wished to join the High Mountain Fortress and restore their former way of life. To show her sincerity, Hutt also brought a message for Richard. She informed him that the Kobolds had gained the assistance of a dangerous shaman and advised Richard to be cautious. Just then, Richard also saw a notification pop up on his system. Along with the Human Horse Tribe's request to join, it displayed each member's characteristics clearly. In that case, Richard decided to fulfill the request of the Human Horse Tribe. Not only would it make up for their lack of ranged units, but it would also strengthen their overall forces. After joining Richard's team, Hutt informed everyone that although the Kobolds had organized an army, there were many factions within their group, and they needed to divide labor and make preparations. Therefore, it would take at least 10 days for them to arrive at the High Mountain Fortress. Upon hearing this news, Annie and Gunter had completely different reactions. Annie felt worried and unsure of what to do, while Gunter displayed a greedy expression. Richard carefully examined the map in his hand. With 10 days, they had enough time to prepare for the upcoming battle. He confidently told everyone that he had already formulated a plan to deal with the situation. Annie and Gunther both looked at each other with curiosity upon hearing this. Richard held up five fingers to Annie, indicating that he wanted to borrow 500 coins from her. Annie breathed a sigh of relief upon hearing this and immediately said that she could lend him the money. Late at night, Richard took Hut to a small grove. Due to the system's influence, Richard knew that the Centaur tribe was skilled in archery. Therefore, immediately after borrowing the money from Annie, he purchased equipment for them. After looking around, Richard ultimately chose a medium-priced purple long bow and white feather arrows. Hutt took the long bow and closed his eyes to feel the sounds around him. Richard watched Hutt's entrancing archery skills and felt very satisfied. With a team like this, the long-range output of the High Mountain Fortress would definitely be greatly enhanced. Just then, a one-eyed subordinate ran over in a panic and told Richard that the reinforcements for the merchant caravan had been attacked. Without hesitation, Richard immediately called for his men to rush to the scene. However, he was ultimately a step too late, and the reinforcements had already been completely wiped out. As he looked at the body strewn across the ground, Richard told Annie that the High Mountain Fortress was no longer safe. It would be best for her to take a group of healthy mercenaries and travel lightly back to Solon City. However, Annie firmly stated that she would not abandon the injured mercenaries. Seeing how loyal and compassionate Annie was, Richard no longer tried to persuade her. Considering the current dangerous situation, if you want to stay, you will have to pay more. Richard said. Upon hearing Richard's demand, Annie still compromised and agreed to it. Hot picked up a spear from the ground and said to Richard, there's a smell of pine oil on the weapon. As a time traveler, Richard immediately understood that these weapons were crafted by the indigenous people themselves. Annie turned her head and said calmly, In fact, there are many powerful tribes further north in the wilderness. They have thousands of soldiers and often engage in wars to fight for territory. Making their own weapons is a common way to strengthen their power. Annie paused for a moment and continued, Currently, kobolds are rallying their troops, so the appearance of these weapons may not be a coincidence. After listening to the other's explanation, Richard smiled even more happily. In his eyes, these were all experience points and gold coins. Since they dared to come, it was the perfect opportunity to defeat them all. In the blink of an eye, ten days had passed. On this day, a centaur scout came to report that the enemy had set up camp 50 miles down the mountain and was expected to reach High Mountain Fortress tomorrow. Richard's face lit up with joy and excitement. He had been waiting for this moment for so long and it had finally arrived. Richard and his men arrived at the battlefield, 
dressed in armor purchased from the system. Before them was a massive enemy army, numbering more than five times Richard's own forces. However, Richard's men did not show any signs of fear, but instead were excited for the coming battle. Richard ordered the archers to initiate two rounds of arrow rain attacks first, before leading the entire army to charge forward. This simple and crude battle plan shocked Annie a bit. Standing atop the mountain, the Jackals and Cobalt's leaders looked down upon the battlefield with contempt, believing their opponents to be no match for them. They immediately ordered their entire army to attack, and the two sides engaged in a fierce battle within the canyon. Richard led his tribe's archers to launch a volley of arrows, causing heavy casualties on the enemy side. In response, the indigenous people started to fight back by throwing spears at Richard's army. However, Richard was already charging ahead on Windchaser, his sturdy armor blocking most of the enemy attacks. Soon, the two sides engaged in close combat. Richard descended from the sky on his Windchaser, causing a shockwave that sent a large group of enemy soldiers flying. Under his leadership, the barbarians fought with increasing bravery. In Richard's first charge, he inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy, with over half of their forces either killed or wounded. As they watched Richard wreak havoc and destruction upon all those who stood in his way, Gunther and his men were filled with shock and awe, gazing upon Richard as if they had seen a devil in the flesh. At this point, the leaders of the Kobolds and Jackal standing atop the hill were beginning to panic. They turned to the wizard standing behind them, realizing that this was their last hope, their final ace in the hole. The wizard stood before a blazing fire, muttering incantations under his breath. In the next moment, a massive fireball shot up into the sky, hurtling towards Richard's army. The wizard had directed the fireball towards them with precision and intent. The fireball in midair caused Richard's expression to turn grave for the first time. The terrifying shockwave of the explosion even shattered his weapon into pieces. The shaman wizard on the other side was indeed formidable, and they needed to come up with a plan to deal with her. Soon enough, Richard also noticed that the wizard was using a wand to control the fireball. He then ordered his horsemen to launch a ranged attack, sending a barrage of arrows towards the wizard. The dense rain of arrows honed in on the wizard. The leader of the jackals quickly realized the situation and called upon his followers to protect the wizard. They rushed to shield the wizard from the incoming attack. Just as H thought they had the upper hand, Richard's spear flew towards him. The enormous force behind the spear shattered the wizard's wand into two, catching them off guard. With the wand destroyed, the fireball in midair burst into countless smaller fireballs, falling towards the ground. The area below the fireball's trajectory was where the kobold's army was stationed. As he looked upon the sea of corpses, Richard sneered in contempt. Meanwhile, the wizard had begun casting another spell towards a disc-shaped object. Just as Richard thought he had won the battle and began to prepare for a cleanup, the dead natives suddenly rose up from the ground, charging towards them like zombies. Richard was shocked and horrified at the sight of the undead rising up. He had not expected the enemy to be capable of sanguinary magic. However, for Invincible Richard, dozens of zombies posed no real threat. After disposing of the undead, Richard charged towards the leader of the kobolds alone. Seeing the wizard mount the kobold to escape, Richard threw his helmet at them, knocking them both down to the ground. With a wicked grin on his face, Richard approached the fallen wizard, only to realize that she was a girl. At that moment, Gunther, who was clearing the battlefield, noticed that many of the barbarians were badly injured. Richard grabbed the wizard up and ordered her to use her magic to heal the wounded. The wizard, afraid of getting beaten, had no choice but to comply. Under her spellcasting, the injured barbarian's wounds gradually healed. Richard couldn't help but think to himself on the side. This wizard not only knows magic but also has healing abilities. Staying in High Mountain Fortress will surely be of great use. But the other natives weren't so lucky. They were all taken back as slaves. After defeating the Cobalt Army, Richard not only received a large amount of system rewards, but also captured the leader of Cobalts and the wizard. Richard had hoped to get the wizard to reveal the location of the bandit's stronghold, but he didn't expect the wizard to be so stubborn. She even boasted about having the blood of a red dragon and refused to submit to the barbarians. However, Richard did not indulge her behavior and punched her directly to the ground. After being hit, the wizard was no longer arrogant and obediently revealed her name as model. She told Richard that their stronghold was located deep in the mountains, about 200 miles away. 
This operation had basically mobilized their most skilled warriors, leaving only the old, weak, women, and children in the mountain stronghold. Richard was holding Model and continued to ask what spells shamans know. Model said with a crying voice, there are many kinds of shamans in the wilderness. She has the bloodline of a red dragon. She excels at fire magic, while towering shamans control earth elements. Troll shamans can cause earthquakes and landslides with their mastery of wood elements. They can also control trees and vines. After hearing what Model had to say, Richard also understood that the wilderness was full of dangers. They're useless, so bury them alive behind a mountain. Model panicked upon hearing this and anxiously told Richard that she still have some value to offer. She said seriously that she discovered two remarkably talented trolls on the high mountain fortress who have a natural gift for practicing magic. With proper training, they are certain to become extremely powerful shamans with immeasurable magical abilities. And so, Model obediently became the mentor to the troll, while the slaves that Richard brought back worked tirelessly to rebuild the high mountain fortress. This time, he was determined to make the fortress the strongest and most impregnable castle in the wilderness. At the same time, Richard called for Hut and assigned her to lead a small team to investigate the stronghold that Model mentioned, to see if she was telling the truth. After seeing off Hut, Richard went to the back mountain to check on the troll's progress in training. Model told Richard that through her coaching, one of the trolls had awakened the star skin surgery skill in order to avoid being beaten. Not only that, but to further avoid being beaten, the troll also evolved the ability to become invisible. But the other troll still hasn't awakened any special skill yet. Richard thought to himself that although the ability to turn invisible may seem a bit weak, at least it is a magical skill. Just then, Annie called out to Richard from behind. She reminded him that they had safely returned to Solon City with his help last time and that they were passing by this area on another business trip. She stopped to say hello. Richard approached and examined the contents of the car, which turned out to be full of coal. Annie explained to him that they used this coal to trade with the dwarves for gold coins and fur. Annie continues to explain that last year, the dwarves discovered an iron ore vein in Lake Bayou, which is why they are purchasing a large amount of coal from them. At that moment, Richard suddenly received a letter from the Lord of Solon City. He asked all the nobles who were expanding their territories outside to hurry back to the city. At the same time, Hut came running towards Richard looking distressed. She reported that they passed by a dwarf tribe on their way back and found piles of corpses on the ground. Just as they were wondering who could have done it, a huge black figure appeared in front of them. Richard immediately identified the attackers as bare men. Hut looked surprised and wondered how Richard knew. Richard produced a letter he received from the city lord, who warned everyone to return to the city as soon as possible. It was because they had discovered a large wave of bare men heading south, and many noble lords had already encountered danger. Richard, however, being the proud warrior that he is, doesn't intend to run away like a coward. He turns to Annie and says, It seems like your business with the dwarves can't be completed. Why don't you give me the coal instead? Annie looked at Richard with confusion. In fact, the reason why Richard wanted the coal was because he also built a factory. The weapons used in High Mountain Fortress were all made by himself. He led Annie to a tent where he kept his creations. This is something that only exists in my true homeland. The high-tech equipment before them left Annie and Model stunned. As night fell, Richard and his group arrived at the Dwarf Tribe's village. They saw the ground covered with corpses and footprints left by bare men. Hut shuddered at the memory. If Richard hadn't upgraded the speed attribute of his centaur tribe, they might have been completely defeated. Richard ordered his men to search for anything useful around the area. Annie stood aside and said calmly, Bear men are a violent and greedy race. They wouldn't leave anything valuable behind. However, Richard doesn't think so. Everyone has a different definition of value. Just then, he suddenly noticed a jar filled with dark liquid inside the tent. Upon approaching, he realized that it was a jar full of soy sauce. Indeed, those bear men don't know the benefits of soy sauce. If we bring this soy sauce back to Solon City, we can open a restaurant and make a fortune. Richard's wild idea impressed even Annie, who was a seasoned merchant. Afterward, Richard arranged for everyone to camp overnight on the spot. They wouldn't go back without seeing the bear men during this expedition. Annie looked worried, as she believed that the bear men and the dwarves were engaged in a conflict. She thought they should steer clear of them. However, Richard explained to her that the two tribes were probably fighting over the iron mine. In this age of primitive weapons, whoever controls the iron mine holds the upper hand. Since they were able to compete for it, why couldn't they acquire it themselves? But Annie still wanted to persuade Richard. 
A large-scale war like this was beyond the capabilities of the High Mountain Fortress Army. However, Richard confidently replied, The High Mountain Fortress is not what it used to be. We not only have cannons that surpass this era, but also a magical group consisting of three wizards, not to mention my brave and skilled barbarian warriors and archery troops. Richard drew his dragon-slaying sword and stood atop a high tower. The soldiers below were all fired up and ready to go. Richard shouted loudly, This battle is not only for the High Mountain Fortress but also for yourselves. In this war, we must be a hard stick that can knock down the enemy. Under the cover of night, Richard led his army to the dwarf's castle. He had intended to strike first, but a group of rabbits beat him to it. As he watched a group of rabbits raiding the castle, Richard wondered why there were rabbits involved in a battle between the bear men and the dwarves. But the others present explained one by one that on this continent, powerful races would recruit relatively weaker races as their vassals and often make them do menial work. The group of rabbits was precisely the bear men's vassals. At this point, the rabbits had already climbed over the wall, and the dwarven guards had not noticed them. Soon, the little rabbits had gained the upper hand and launched a final assault. Just then, a cannon blast sent a large group of rabbits flying. Richard stood in the distance with a smug expression on his face, and the cannon beside him was still emitting thick smoke. The enraged rabbits, thinking that the reinforcements for the dwarves had arrived, turned their attack towards Richard and charged towards him. However, Richard was well prepared for the attack, and the rabbits were no match for his barbarian army. As his troops fought more and more fiercely, the rabbit clan soon became powerless and unable to resist. Suddenly, Richard felt the ground shaking and turned around to see a huge shadow looming behind him. Richard could only helplessly defend himself against the bear men, who were several times larger than him. The rabbit tribe also launched a counterattack under the leadership of the bear men. Although the bear men had more people on their side, Richard's troops were not to be trifled with. They had well-trained centaur units acting as rear guard, and they also had a team of magic advisors. Model began to cast a spell, launching a series of fireballs at the Bear Men tribe. At the same time, the two trolls that had been trained by Model also proved to be very effective. The dwarf tribe on the city wall was momentarily confused. They were the ones who were supposed to be beaten, but they had been rescued. The key issue was that they didn't even know who their saviors were. But on the battlefield, there simply wasn't enough time for them to contemplate these matters. Let me show you the power of a lord. Richard activated Sky Power Activate and sliced one of the bear men in half with a single strike. However, on the other side, Gunther wasn't as lucky. The bear man swung his large hand, sending Gonsar flying with tremendous force. Even Russell's weapon couldn't harm the bear man in the slightest. A sword light sliced through the air, instantly decapitating the bear man. It was Richard who made the saving blow, allowing Gonsar to escape from danger. And this was thanks to the troll stone skin and invisibility spells. These two abilities not only could be used on themselves, but could also be applied to teammates on a large scale. Just as Gunther and his group thought they had won a complete victory, a red smoke suddenly appeared on the battlefield. The fallen bear men and rabbits slowly stood up in the smoke. Model, who was knowledgeable and experienced, immediately recognized that this was the spell of Berserk. The ones who could cast this kind of magic were the Minotaurs of the Crescent Tribe. She explained to Richard that there was a tribe of Minotaurs living in the southwest of the Pompeii Empire. They were wild and aggressive by nature, and with the Shaman's Berserk spell in their tribe, they were invincible on the battlefield. That's why many people called them the Bloodhook Tribe. As he watched the group of Berserk bear men and rabbits, Richard began to search for the one who cast the spell. Model said with a solemn expression, the opponents are only in a state of partial Berserk, so the caster should not be present at the scene. Upon hearing this, Richard felt relieved. This group of defeated soldiers was not a match for Gunther and his team. After driving away the bear men and rabbits, Richard arrived at the front of the dwarf castle. The dwarves looked very wary of Richard and asked about his intentions. But when they saw Annie, they immediately opened the castle gate and welcomed them inside. As soon as they entered the castle, the dwarf leader, Robbie, could no longer hold back and tearfully recounted their ordeal to Andy. If it weren't for their help, their army would have been completely wiped out. Upon seeing Robbie's reaction, Richard couldn't help but laugh. Robbie thought that Richard was mocking him and glared at him with anger. Andy quickly stepped in to defuse the situation. The two parties then ended their unpleasant conversation and went their separate ways. Along the way, 
and he kept advising Richard not to take it to heart. However, Richard had a deep disdain for Robbie. In his view, a weeping and emotional leader like Robbie was simply incapable of winning this battle. Upon arriving in the resting room, Richard was able to lie down and take a nap, but Hutt had to kneel on the ground to rest. The room prepared for them by the dwarf was simply too low for Hutt's height. Just then, the house suddenly shook violently. Richard, looking alert, sat up in bed and went to the window to investigate. It turned out that the Minotaurs had returned with the bear men to seek revenge. Meanwhile, on the city walls, a group of dwarves quickly entered a state of preparedness, picking up their horns and sounding the alarm. Soon, a large army gathered in front of the city gate. As Richard and his group stood in front of the dwarves, the dwarven army was still somewhat resentful. After all, Richard had previously mocked them while they were in the castle. The proud dwarven army refused to let Richard and his group steal the spotlight, and confidently walked up to confront them. They even asked Richard to step back and let them take charge. Due to their short stature, their enemies had to stoop down to attack them, giving the dwarves a natural advantage in combat. Seeing the proud and stubborn dwarves, Richard could only smile and let them have their way. However, the dwarves' plan was too simplistic. After just one charge, they were easily defeated and scattered by the enemy. Robbie, who was standing on the city wall, suddenly panicked and asked Richard if the previous cannon was still usable. Richard reluctantly informed him that they had already run out of cannonballs. Robbie then turned to his subordinates and asked how many crossbow bolts they had left. They told him they only had six left. Robbie had no choice but to decide to use all of the crossbow bolts against the Minotaurs. Although the crossbow bolt could inflict damage on the Minotaurs, they were still outnumbered and overwhelmed. Soon enough, the enemy had arrived at the city gates. Richard's face became serious. He glanced at Gunther and asked, Why haven't I seen my magic team after such a long time? Gunther informed Richard that Model had planned to escape upon sensing the danger but she had already been caught and brought back by them. Richard grabbed Model by the arm and exclaimed, How dare you try to escape at such a crucial moment? You are a disgrace. Even if the enemy has the power of frenzy, you still have bloodthirsty magic, don't you? Upon hearing the words bloodthirsty magic, Robbie seemed to have found a lifeline and urged Richard to use it immediately. However, Richard ignored him and ordered Model to use the bloodthirsty magic against the enemy instead. This statement shocked the whole room, and Robbie was convinced that Richard had gone mad. However, Richard showed a mysterious expression and said, Stop talking nonsense and do as I say. Model had no choice but to follow the orders she was given. The already violent Minotaurs became even more frenzied after being infused with the bloodthirsty magic, <laughs> causing several dwarves who were too slow to escape to be terrified. Model thought Richard had completely lost his mind when she saw the effect of the bloodthirsty magic. She tried to run away, but Richard caught her and asked her to open her eyes and see clearly. The Minotaurs infused with bloodthirsty magic appeared to be exceptionally aggressive, but Richard had already noticed the flaw in both frenzy and bloodthirsty magic. The larger the creature, the greater the burden on its heart. Therefore, he had the idea to combine both spells, knowing that it would cause the enemy's heart to exceed its limit. Although the attack by the Bloodhoof tribe was temporarily halted, there may be a bigger storm brewing and the Dwarven stronghold could become even more dangerous. Richard kindly reminded Robbie to make more crossbows and bolts, as they would come in handy in the future. Upon hearing this, Robbie looked troubled. It wasn't that he didn't want to build it, it was that he lacked the parts. Upon arriving at the castle, Robbie showed Richard the crossbow bed. Although they had already built many of them and they were very powerful, they still lacked bowstrings. Since the crossbow bed was made entirely of steel, ordinary sheep tendons could not withstand the tension. Although they discovered that giant leeches could be used after being dried and dehydrated, these things were rare and could not be bought with money. Hearing this, Richard had an idea. Although he couldn't buy giant leeches, he could buy other substitutes in the system mall. And the Komodo dragon tendons could solve this problem. Hearing this, Robbie was so excited that he took off. Because what their dwarf race lacked the least was gold coins. Looking at the crossbow equipped with Komodo dragon tendons, Robbie told Richard that although the bowstrings were now more durable than before, if they encountered a large number of enemies again, they would still not last long. Seeing Robbie so scared, Richard suggested that they withdraw from Lake Bayou first, because the purpose of the enemy's arrival was their iron ore. They could wait until the enemy fought each other and was seriously injured before taking back Lake Bayou. After hearing Richard's words, Robbie waved his hands repeatedly. 
There was more than just iron ore in Lake Bayou. There was also a secret that could not be told. Seeing that the other party did not want to say it, Richard did not ask any further and turned and left the castle. At this time in the council hall, the dwarves were discussing whether to tell Richard the secret at the bottom of the lake. Although everyone knew that Richard came for iron or two, at least he didn't rob it hard compared to the enemy. Moreover, their strength is now insufficient to resist subsequent enemy forces. Instead of guarding a secret and being exterminated, it is better to find an ally to protect them. So after final discussions, Robbie decided to take Richard to see for himself at the bottom of the lake. Wearing diving helmets, Richard and three others came to the depths of the lake floor. The scene before him stunned Richard. Thick iron chains were wrapped around an ancient giant. And this was a titan giant. The group swam quietly to the giant's face. The giant seemed to be able to sense their presence, and a pair of huge eyes emitted red light. After coming to the surface, Richard took off his helmet and exclaimed that he didn't expect the secret in the water to be an ancient giant. Robbie also explained to him that they had accidentally discovered it while mining iron ore. The reason why they are now guarding this giant is because he is their ancestor of the dwarf race. Hearing this, Richard's mouth began to twitch. What kind of giant could give birth to your group of dwarves? Robbie saw that Richard did not believe him and jumped directly into the water. He saw that red light was emitted from under his body, which was exactly the evidence Robbie claimed. As an ancient magical creature, the Titan Giant had a higher status than the Giant Dragon. Their existence was a symbol of power. However, they withdrew from the stage of history as time passed. Richard asked why they didn't just break through the mountain and take the Giant away since they had discovered the Titan Giant. Robbie said helplessly that it was not that they didn't want to, but that they couldn't. The iron ore here can emit a special magnetic field that constrains the Titan's soul within its eyeballs. At first, the red light emitted by the Titan was very strong. As they continue to mine iron ore, it has dimmed a lot now. So they have already ordered a ban on mining iron ore. Although Richard understood their beliefs, they couldn't always guard the Titan until he died. Robbie explained that after many years of research, they had discovered some patterns. As long as it is on the night of the full moon, the power of the Titan can be maximally stimulated. According to the description in the ancient books of their clan, this soul power can be inherited. So they thought about casting spells on the night of the full moon to inherit the power of the Titan. According to the elders of the Dwarf tribe, tomorrow will be the roundest moment of the moon in this century. At that time, casting spells is most likely to inherit the power of the Titan. Richard finally understood why this group of dwarves were determined to guard Lake Bayou even if they died. At this time, Robbie also suggested that Richard try it tomorrow night too. Maybe his power could be recognized by the Titan. Richard didn't take Robbie's words to heart. If it was really as Robbie said, and the Titan was their ancestor, then it would definitely be easier for dwarves with blood ties to succeed. Compared to the Titan giant, Richard is now more concerned about the enemy's movements. Sure enough, after Richard returned to the castle, Hutt rushed back because her scouts had discovered enemy forces and this time their army had exceeded 5,000 people. It seems that there will be another big battle tomorrow. The dwarf army quickly established defensive fortifications. This time the enemy even deployed the bear king. This made the dwarf race fight like trap beasts. At this time, Robbie was already scared out of his wits. He now placed all his hopes on the power of the titan on the night of the full moon. Looking at the depressed Robbie, Richard could only helplessly encourage him to cheer up. Just then, the Orc Alliance launched a total attack. Richard saw this and made a decisive decision to order the archers on the city wall and under the city to release a wave of arrows first. Although a dense raid of arrows killed a group of orcs, it couldn't stop the advance of the bear men. Troll and Model stood on the city wall and kept launching fireball spells. The entire battlefield was filled with smoke and fire. Both sides took out their own skills to kill their opponents. But with the advantage of numbers and size, bear men and minotaurs quickly gained the upper hand. Richard saw this and drew his sword and rushed into the battlefield. He instantly cut off a bear man's arm and saved a teammate. But this also attracted the attention of the bear king. The bear king picked up a meteor hammer and hit Richard. Richard blocked with his sword, but the opponent's strength was really terrifying. Richard was instantly knocked out. This further boosted the morale of bear men's soldiers. Richard glared fiercely and bit his teeth before rushing back with his sword again. In this way, this battle lasted from dawn until dusk. The scene was already full of corpses, but neither side gave up. Richard looked at the system panel with a worried look. This was the first time that his subordinates had suffered heavy casualties. 
Looking at the enemy forces pouring into the battlefield, Richard emotionlessly issued an order to retreat. The current situation is already impossible to break through successfully. Only by holding onto the castle to consume the other party can there be a glimmer of hope. Upon arriving at the castle, Richard was furious when he saw Robbie squatting in the corner and crying bitterly. The army outside was ramming the city gate. Seeing that Robbie couldn't be counted on, Richard had to order everyone to block the city gate. But the enemy was too numerous and it started to rain heavily. The wizard's fireball spell couldn't work at all. And just then, the city gate was finally knocked out with a big hole. A group of minotaurs and bear men showed excited expressions and were about to rush in. Richard turned his head and asked Robbie how many people they had left. Robbie said helplessly that there were only more than 100 people left. Looking at the nearly thousand enemy forces, Richard showed a bloodthirsty smile. In this way, if they want to win this battle, at least one person has to fight 10 people. Under Richard's command, whether it was barbarians or dwarves or centaurs, they all joined the charge team and fought with the enemy. Richard was full of momentum and killed a large number in an instant. But the dwarves didn't have his strength. If this continues, they will be wiped out sooner or later. Seeing this, Richard turned his head and shouted for Model to cast Bloodthirst on the dwarves. Model struck a constipated pose. After a brief spell casting, golden light descended from the sky. At the same time, Troll also cast stone skin on them. Uh... The eyes of the dwarf army were red and their fighting power soared. The enemy was ruthlessly crushed before they could react. Soon the rabbit army fell at the feet of the dwarves. Seeing this, the Bear King ordered the Sheep Army to charge. But Richard was prepared. He ordered Troll to use wood magic to block the enemy. Thick branches divided the battlefield in two. The Bear King was furious when he saw this. But this was only Richard's first step. The next second, Richard had Troll cast invisibility on him and quietly approached the Bear King from behind. Richard was going to strike at the isolated Bear King. It was time to end it. Richard stabbed the Bear King with a sword. The leader was killed. Everyone on the scene stopped their actions and looked at Richard in shock. Someone in the crowd shouted Ron, and the scene became chaotic. Seeing this, the barbarians also began to pursue their victory. After a fierce battle, the castle was finally defended, but everyone paid a heavy price. However, after this battle, Richard's men gained a lot of experience. Just as Richard was checking his system panel, Robbie, dressed in full regalia, came up behind him with his men. It turned out that tonight's full moon night was the day they held a ceremony to inherit the power of Titan. As per their previous agreement, they planned to have Richard try it out as well. Although Richard wasn't particularly interested in these things, he went along with Robbie with a curious mindset. The group arrived underwater and, as the dwarves cast their spells, the Titan giant buried beneath the lake slowly rose to the surface. Looking at the giant before them, Robbie waved a stick above his head like a butcher trying to shoo away flies. The nearby dwarves followed Robbie's lead and jumped around with him. With the sound of a horn blown by one of the dwarves, flames were lit around the scene. Then, a candidate who had been pre-selected as the heir stepped into the fire circle and solemnly chanted a spell. On the side, Richard asked Model in a low voice if there was any danger. Model smirked, saying that if the heir could truly inherit the soul of the giant, then these dwarves' bodies would not be able to withstand it, and there could be an explosion on the spot. Hearing this, Richard broke out in a cold sweat and silently rejoiced that the power of the soul had not been injected into his body. At this point, the dwarf undergoing the ceremony had finished chanting the spell, but unfortunately, nothing happened. One after another, the dwarf candidates entered the fire circle, but the results were the same. Robbie had a bitter expression, and none of the carefully selected dwarves met the criteria. Then, he suddenly remembered that Richard hadn't tried it yet and frowned, urging him to give it a try. Although Richard didn't take it seriously, he reluctantly agreed and followed the others into the fire circle. However, at this moment, the fire circle suddenly changed. The giant's eyes emitted a golden light, as if about to explode halfway. Richard quickly dodged, and then the crowd suddenly saw a creature's figure in the giant's eyes. The cute little divine beast before them was actually born from the ancient god race inside the titan giant's body. But it was this little animal that made the dwarves shout ancestor in unison. Richard grabbed the creature to take a closer look, and the dwarves crowded around eagerly. However, at that moment, Richard suddenly felt that something was wrong. 
There seemed to be energy about to be released from the creature's body, so he quickly threw it to the group of dwarves. Unexpectedly, the little animal had inherited the thunder spell of the Titan race. Richard was both surprised and delighted, and at that moment, the Titan giant, which had been standing in the middle of the lake, seemed to have completed its mission and began to crumble bit by bit. And so, Richard's story at the Dwarves Fortress came to a close.